Here's a really nice integral that can be evaluated pretty smoothly using contour integration. However, since here at Maths 505 we're all sickos, I wanted to present an approach to this integral that's a bit more extravagant than contour integration. So yeah, the evaluation of this integral today involves Feynman's trick plus a couple or more than couple of tricks from some more special functions. So sit back, relax, and let the mathematical extravagance amaze you. So let's call our integral i, and because we're using Feynman's technique, we need to define an integral function i of some parameter t, which we'll define as the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the t divided by 1 plus x squared squared dx. And the reason we're using such a structure for our integral function is because if you take the partial derivative with respect to t of x to the t, you get x to the t times the natural log of x. So you recover this term here in the numerator of our target integral on differentiation with respect to t. However, we do know that in order to differentiate under the integral sign, we need our integral to actually converge. And that is the case for t being a real number between 0 and 1. So if we define our parameter this way and we differentiate with, res uh, with respect to it, we can indeed perform the switch up of the integration and the differentiation operators. So we're left with the integral from 0 to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to t of x to the t divided by 1 plus x squared squared dx. And because we're differentiating partially with respect to t, all the x terms are constants. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by 1 plus x squared squared times x to the t times the natural log of x dx. And this here is the structure for the derivative of your integral function. Notice here that our target integral is in fact the derivative of your integral function evaluated at t being equal to 0. So this here is our target. Okay, so already things are looking pretty fancy. So coming back to our integral function i of t, which was the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the t divided by 1 plus x squared squared dx, we can translate this into a beta function using a simple substitution. So if you let x squared equal to u, this implies that 2x dx equals du. So I'm going to need a factor of 2 and a factor of 1 half, and you can write x to the t as x to the t minus 1 times x. So you have some stuff in the numerator that evaluates to your new differential element du, and you're left with 1 half of the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the... Now, if x is u to the 1 half, then x to the t minus 1 is just u to the t minus 1 by 2. And you have this differential element, and all of this is being divided by 1 plus u squared. So this is the structure of your integral function i of t in the u world. Okay, cool. And to translate this into a beta function, Recall that the beta function with complex arguments x and y is given by the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the y minus 1 du divided by 1 plus u to the x plus y. So on comparing the exponents, we say that y minus 1 equals t minus 1 by 2, which implies the y equal 2 minus 1, 1 plus t by 2. Also notice that x plus y equals 2, which implies that x equals 2 minus y, which is 1 plus t by 2. So you get a 4 minus 1 minus t. So that's 3 minus t by 2. So all of this implies that your integral function i of t is actually one half 
of the beta function evaluated at 3 minus t by 2 and 1 plus t by 2. Now we only ever need the beta function when we want to summon its legendary cousin, uh, the gamma function. So we have 1 half of gamma 3 minus t by 2 times gamma 1 plus t by 2 divided by the gamma function with the sum of these two terms as its argument. Okay, cool. So the t's cancel out nicely. You're left with 3 by 2 plus 1 half. That's uh, 2. So the gamma function evaluated at 2 is just 1 factorial, which is 1, right? So we can get rid of the denominator. And we have this structure for i of t in terms of the gamma function. Now recall that we were interested in the derivative of i at t being equal to 0. So let's differentiate this expression for the integral function and we get i prime of t being equal to 1 half of the derivative of the gamma function at 3 minus t by 2 and because of the chain rule you're going to get an extra negative sign plus another factor of uh, 1 by 2. So this is 1 by 4 times gamma 1 plus t by 2 plus 1 fourth again because of this thing here. So you have gamma 3 minus t by 2 times gamma prime 1 plus t by 2. And there's a positive sign there. Okay, no problems with the signs. And our target integral i is just the derivative of the integral function at t being equal to zero. So that means our target integral i equals negative one-fourth of gamma prime three by two times gamma one by two plus one-fourth of gamma three by two times gamma prime one by two. Okay, there is a lot of stuff going on here, especially the fact that we need the derivative of the gamma function at two different arguments. And honestly, the gamma function itself won't cut it. We're going to have to do something even more exotic. We're going to need the digamma function, which is psi of z. And the digamma function is defined as the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. So it's gamma prime z divided by gamma z, which implies that the derivative of the gamma function at z equals digamma z times gamma z, which is pretty cool. It's a very nice relation. So this will imply that our two derivatives, that is gamma prime 1 by 2 equals digamma 1 by 2 times gamma 1 by 2, which is just the square root of pi. Okay, cool, and di, uh, the derivative of the gamma function at 3 by 2 equals di gamma 3 by 2 times gamma 3 by 2. And what exactly is gamma 3 by 2? Well, using the recurrence relation for the gamma function with uh, z being equal to 1 half, we get gamma 3 by 2 being equal to 1 half of gamma 1 by 2. So that's half the square root of pi. Okay, cool. So let's just erase all of this and write here 1 half of the square root of pi. Okay, cool. Now to incorporate this into our equation, this implies that i equals um, negative uh, this is, this is, uh, all of this, right? So you have a square root of pi and gamma one by two is again the square root of pi. So you have pi divided by two, four, eight. Let's not forget the negative sign. And you're left with di gamma three by two. Okay, cool. Plus, uh, one fourth, again, um, uh, this is square root pi by 2. So yeah, you get another uh, 1 eighth and square root pi. And for the derivative of the gamma function of 1 by 2, again, square root of pi. So you have pi by 8 again. 
and you're left with di gamma 1 by 2. Okay, so now we have the integral function in terms of di gamma functions, and you may be thinking, wait, we're just making things worse, but believe me, uh, we're not. This is actually some pretty awesome stuff. So we have negative pi by 8 factored out, and we have di gamma 3 by 2 minus di gamma 1 by 2. And this is a really nice structure because 3 by 2 is just 1 plus 1 by 2. So we can use a pretty nice difference relation for the di gamma function, which states that di gamma z plus 1 minus di gamma z equals 1 by z. And the proof here is pretty satisfying in that you only need the recurrence relation for the gamma function, which states that gamma z plus 1 equals z times gamma z. So differentiating with respect to z gives you gamma prime z plus 1 equal to z times gamma prime z plus gamma z. Gamma prime. Sounds like a nice idea for some comic book character. Anyway, so now that we have the derivatives of the gamma function, we can reintroduce the the di gamma function. So we have di gamma z plus 1 times gamma z plus 1 being equal to z times di gamma z times gamma z plus gamma z. And dividing both sides by gamma z plus 1, which is of course z times gamma z, we have some really nice cancellations. So there you go, and there they go, and once again. So this implies that di gamma z plus 1 equals all that's left here is ga di gamma z, right? So let's take it to the left, and we have minus gamma z being equal to 1 by z, which completes our proof. And now would be an excellent time to like and subscribe. And if you get the feeling that the entire purpose of this video was just for me to get to use the di gamma function, well, yes, that is almost all of the motivation for this video came from the di gamma function. But it was pretty awesome, so yeah, you, you can't exactly blame me for that. Anyway, so we have negative pi by 8, and according to our difference relation, all of this equals the reciprocal of 1 half, which is 2, which implies that our integral, that from 0 to infinity of the natural log of x divided by 1 plus x squared squared dx equals negative pi by 4, which is indeed the correct result. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.